Thank you very much and good morning, everybody. Uh, you can hear me with the mic, yes. Uh, thank you for the invitation and for the kind introduction. I think I understood most of it, although I'm not perfect in Spanish, but uh, it sounded familiar. I recognize the places I've been to and worked at. Uh, I've prepared for you um, a three-part presentation. Uh, first of all, it's the intro of the situation uh, about uh, where I come from, why I'm here, what we are doing in Norway. Second part is the now situation where we are really in the world on the verge of building thermosus. Third one is really the uh, pondering, the um, discussion of uh, what's next, what's coming after all these buzzwords of uh, low energy buildings, passive buildings, zero energy building, net zero energy buildings, etc. So I think I have roughly 45 minutes, right? And I would be uh, happy to receive your, um, ans your questions and comments uh, after that. Now first to the uh, intro. Um, I, uh, I come from Norway and as you know Norway is uh, up here, a uh, small nation of 5 million people. Um, I love my country, it's uh, beautiful and rich because of oil and other activities. But uh, like any country, it's, uh, there are things that are wrong with it and it needs to be fixed. So I am going to give you a, a slight introduction to um, what, what is actually behind these um, uh, glossy pictures of a beautiful nation with the fjords and the richness. This is the Nobel Peace Prize medal that we hand out every year on the 10th of December. Uh, and the Peace Prize is, of course, to the person or organization that has done the most to reduce standing armies. But when you really look at what we make our living on in Norway, it is not only oil, as you see on the right here, we are the world's uh, sixth largest oil exporter and the world's uh, second largest gas exporter. But we are also the world's sixth largest weapon arms exporter. We have a big, big uh, ammunition and arms industry. And per capita, we, I, am responsible for being the world's second largest per capita arms exporter. So um, we are only beaten by the United States. So on the one hand, we hand out this uh, great uh, peace medal. On the other hand, we are exporting the products and manufacturing the products that Alfred Nobel wanted his prize to abolish. So I introduce uh, my presentation like this uh, because I want to talk a little about uh, glossy pictures and what are behind the glossy pictures. Now, this picture you all know, uh, Falling Water, Frank Lloyd Wright, beautiful building, beautiful setting, the building fits into the landscape as a fingers into a glove. It looks like the landscape is totally undisturbed. The fact is not like that. The facts are that the site that um, Falling Water was uh, constructed on was a beautiful site consisting of a rock, hence this painting by Peter Bloom at the Chicago Art Museum, donated to Falling Water, and it was hanging in the building for a long time. It's called a rock because there was a famous rock in this area, and people loved to walk there. And you see, this is the first environmentalist at that time in that area, trying to protect the rock from being destroyed. So the rock was dynamited um, to actually uh, make place for Frank Lloyd Wright's beautiful building. There was an old uh, brick building that uh, suffered the same fate, it had to be demolished. So you see on the left, the building of Frank Lloyd Wright is coming up. So while the pictures the glossy magazines give us is this, the reality is this. Now, to the now situation in terms of the sustainability issue. I think we're on the verge of 
doing maybe too many super insulated buildings. We are actually building thermoses while, which I will come back to, the climate is changing and the temperatures on Earth is getting higher, not lower. This is how we traditionally used to do this in Norway. Uh, the stave churches on the left, we had 1,000 of them. Now we only have 28. They were built from log, just like we built our houses, log upon log, uh, drafty houses, turf roof, a huge uh, log fire inside the building to keep it warm. This shifted within a few decades onto us now doing super insulated houses, 30, 35, 40 centimeter walls, thick, a lot of materials going into it, and air, air condition, uh, heat recovery, and it's a thermos, it's a thermos. The result of this, and we don't only see this in Norway, we see it in big part of the um, colder Europe, is that as the overall energy need of a building is falling like the steps show, we are here today, the energy need of running the building, the green, is getting less and less per year. While what is kept stable is the materials going into the building. So, finally, when we reach this goal that the EU and a lot of other institutions are telling us to go for, uh, we will end up with buildings using very little energy to run from day to day, but they will need a lot of energy for the production of the materials, the production and the transportation of the materials. So this is what we will have to watch as we go, if we go into this zero energy regime. The problem with some of this is that there are always innovations. The innovations are very often hampered by um, the establishment. In, uh, the second, after the Second World War, there was a great engineer in Norway called Olav Selvog, who started the mass production of housing in Norway. From the log, upon log construction, he started doing the American uh, framework using less materials, making the building lighter, mass production, cheaper, easier to put up, and affordable for most people. He was, of course, stopped immediately by the institutions, the traditional engineers, architects, departments, uh, because they were claiming his buildings could not stand up. Uh, so they expelled him from the Association of Engineers because he was thinking new. Now, um, Today, this is the typical way of building in Norway. Less materials, more energy efficient uh, construction, uh, affordable buildings for most people. I experienced exactly the same thing when you try to reach um, uh, new ideas and, and implement them. I did the first uh, uh, so-called in modern time uh, close to zero energy building in, in uh, Northern Europe in 1985, it was built in 88, and it had a, a well-insulated envelope, but only 150 millimeter, because instead of doing it super insulated, we provided a lot of energy, renewable energy, to go into it. Um, it had an air solar heating system in 50% of its envelope, all of the walls and on the roof. It had a windmill to produce electricity, solar PV electricity, non-toxic materials, etc. It was the first really close to zero energy attempt. Uh, the reactions I met were exactly the same that Olaf Selvog met 50 years earlier. Uh, it was from the main institutions stating that this is the wrong signal to send. You are actually sending a signal to people that they can build close to zero energy buildings. They didn't want us to send that signal, they wanted us to send a signal saying we should instead insulate our buildings a little more. So instead of getting the institutions on our side, we were having to fight the institutions. And this is typical when you are working in innovation, the establishment is not always um, adaptable. So, um, in this um, 
uh, project, we also showed how it would be possible in the future uh, to connect electric vehicles to the buildings, how the transportation sector with batteries, solar PV, other renewable energy sources will talk with buildings, smart, uh, smart grids, etc. And this is why I'm in Barcelona mainly uh, for this World Conference of um, EVS 27 out at FIRA, where I'm talking this afternoon. So, um, over the years, uh, we tried to push this uh, field. I've been working a lot with Melitetiki, Alexandros Tombasis in Athens, great uh, practice, um, where we go for, uh, in some competitions like the one I'm showing here in Oslo, the Europe's most energy efficient building competition. The goal was to manage um, energy need totally of 80 kilowatt hours maximum. Uh, the standard in Norway today at that time would be three times that, 230. We managed that easily by combination of things, sensible sizing of windows, uh, some pretty good insulation, renewable energy like solar PV on the roofs um, and solar heating, solar um, thermal. Um, it's not very difficult. We got down to 21 kilowatt hours per square meter per year. So to my students, uh, when I lecture, I normally say, this is kind of the uh, 50 seconds lecture on uh, how do you do a zero energy building. It's quite simple. It's uh, good insulation, small windows, heat recovery, some renewable energy, blah, blah, blah. That's it. And then it's just a matter of implementing these different uh, technologies in the building, architects together with the consultants. I've done this in several uh, climate zones of the world. Um, I will come back to that. Uh, we did, uh, a couple of decades ago, uh, a complete island. Uh, it was never built, but it was possible to build it. Uh, in the Maldives, uh, it was a signal of how can you make an island in the Maldives totally autonomous from uh, fossil fuels. And it, it is possible to do this. Um, at the time, it was impossible to finance it, although the government of Maldives gave us a whole island to experiment on because they wanted to demonstrate to the world that unless we, the Western world, do something about uh, the, the global climate change, Maldives, 1,200 islands, would sink in, sink in the ocean. Here, we did it with um, uh, the buildings were heated, cooled, uh, domestic hot water, etc., by uh, solar. Uh, the transportation on the small island was by solar buggies. Uh, the boat was electric, etc., to take passengers into the island, to, to the main island, to, to the uh, hub. And uh, it's possible to do this. It's uh, technically not very complicated. Uh, of course, you need some money. Now, um, the development and the standard in Norway is now going towards not only looking at the building, but we're looking at the combination of all the parts that go into our life. We are trying to get the CO2 emissions down per capita, and we do this by looking at our lifestyles, what we eat, how architecture creates transportation, where you work versus where you uh, live, creates transportation. So by trying to make a society a slightly denser, we are able to reduce the CO2 emissions per person. Totally today, CO2 emissions per person are around in this part of the world, eight to 10 tons of CO2. We manage with some of these kind of projects to get it down to three, that's no problem. But then if we jump back to my introduction, uh, about Norway's uh, oil exports. We are, uh, as the big exporter, responsible for selling this product that is burnt all over the world. And this product, uh, if we take the CO2 um, made from the burning somewhere in the world of Norwegian oil per Norwegian, per capita, then you can add, there's a printing mistake here, you can add 149 tons of CO2 per person. So my point is, if we really want to do something about getting our CO2 emissions down, we should begin to make our oil 
exports less or then they will say, of course, somebody else will deliver the oil, so it doesn't help very much. But we should begin to look at the total picture of how we burn oil and, you know, what kind of pollution we're creating other places of the world. Anyway, to do these cities of the future, which means getting down to three tons per person, you need to look at the transportation, the infrastructure, the juxtaposition between the different uh, elements a society is composed from. This is getting more and more um, important, and it's getting more and more important because uh, more and more people are moving to the cities. Uh, generally speaking, a city footprint of a person is less than living in a country or living in a big house. So there is a movement here which one thought would be very positive. What we find from studies done in Norway is that it's not only positive because what we are doing in the winters is we're using still our romantic log fire and this romantic log fire is creating a hell of a pollution and this is the picture that you'll actually see in Norwegian cities in the winter for months and months and months. Um, this type of uh, pollution represents 61% of the particles getting into the air. It doesn't come from transportation, it comes from log fires. So, on the one hand, we're very advanced, technologically advanced. On the other hand, we're extremely primitive. And we are romanticizing about our old log fires. What we do find, though, is that when people move from a rural situation or from a big house into a flat, they begin to lose uh, their contact with nature. And because they do, they begin to long for nature, not only weekend walks or evening walks in the green area, but from in Norway, they start traveling. They travel to Spain in the winter to see the sunshine or, you know, warm rain. Uh, they travel to Thailand. And these long haul flights, they mess up completely our CO2 footprint, our eco footprint. So on the one hand, we try to make our buildings more and more energy efficient, transportation locally less and less, so you can walk to work from where you live. On the other hand, we do a couple of long haul travels a year, and our eco footprint is increasing, not falling. So again, it's this ability to think totally which is important. Anyway, um, 25 years after this first attempt at doing a zero energy building, the same authorities and consultants and uh, institutions that were fighting us uh, are now working on doing Norway's first big zero energy building, which is done by Snøhetta, the famous architects that did the opera in Oslo, the white opera in the city of Oslo. Um, what, I do, what they are doing is exactly the same as uh, you would expect really from this uh, type of building. It's an energy effective volume. That means um, they uh, carve out part of the building so that everybody can have daylight during daytime. So you reduce on the electric light. Um, super insulated building body, meaning 30, 35 centimeter, maybe 40. Um, all controls of the technical systems are, you know, nobody in the room, lights off, <coughs> heating off, cooling off. Um, heat pump to heat and cool the building and finally the, they look at the reduction of uh, uh, embodied energy in the materials. Uh, local production of renewable energy. What you see here is a building completely clad with solar PV, solar electricity, the blue stuff. It's on three out of four uh, uh, facades, not the north facade. So this big building is powered by solar energy in Trondheim, which is high north, uh, and the solar energy electricity goes to running the heat pumps <coughs> to heat and cool it. So by doing that, you will increase your efficiency of the heat pump to a COP of a water-based heat pump of 3.7. So every kilowatt hour you put into the heat pump from solar, you get 3.7 back in a water-based heat pump system. 
Anyway, as opposed to your climate where it's warmer most of the year, where you need um, cooling, natural ventilation, what we are doing is generally speaking this. What we find in Scandinavia generally is that there are two problems with this type of um, thermos production. The daylight is partly blocked because you only have 20% windows to the floor area. And secondly, the uh, overheating is a problem part of the time in the summer. When it's warm nights, it's difficult to keep the building cool. So people introduce their uh, cooling systems. These are the standards we're working to. I'm just going to flick quickly past it. Um, uh, the average uh, degree uh, centigrade is 6.3 uh, in the area in, in, on the west coast. And um, the passive house standard is now being introduced, meaning an energy need of 15 kilowatt hours per square meter per year. And at the bottom, you see the U values we're working to. It's pretty tight buildings. So it's tight buildings, material consuming. We need a lot of construction, a lot of manpower in order to power these buildings, uh, in order to deliver the materials. And it ends up like super insulated thermoses. Thermoses are great for keeping your coffee warm. But as buildings, we see some problems. Now, um, There are strategies in Norway, uh, meaning that uh, we go in a big way for heat pumps, air-to-air -air heat pumps to heat our buildings, and also to cool them in the summer. And what we found in studies is that this is just one strategy. It's a little dangerous strategy because we have tested out people's reaction using 700,000 heat pumps in their homes. And it shows that uh, people are, generally speaking, raising their temperature. When they have installed a gadget, like a heat pump is, they think they are environmentally friendly. So they raise the temperature, they dress lighter, uh, and the gain is lost. They also forget other strategies, like heating their buildings with renewable energy, and they even forget to use their load fire, which I guess is positive. But this one-sided view on strategies is uh, turning into a problem. When we are doing uh, these kind of buildings, um, our um, overall experience is, uh, as I said, overall overheating generally. Uh, the extra cost of a passive house standard is uh, 3 to 8%. So it's costly, it's material uh, demanding, it's uh, not only positive. Um, but the passive house standard, which uh, started in Germany, uh, Austria, uh, Switzerland 20 years ago, is now being applied in our part of the world. But what's more important is that the uh, EU Directive on Energy Performance of Buildings, the EPB, is stating close to zero energy buildings by 2020. So what we have to relate to as professionals is the fact that the EU has decided that the building standards in seven years is going to be close to zero energy. That means we're all going to do super insulated, air conditioned, heat recovered, some renewable energy buildings. We're all pushed into one direction and unless, unless we deliver, we will not get our, get our buildings approved. This is the development, this is the trend. We see it in Sweden, Denmark, and uh, we have to relate to this. And uh, my third part of this presentation looks at what are the consequences on this and are there other strategy. So I'm posing the question, what's next? Now, we are all good boys and girls. We are obedient. We will do what the EU tells us, right? Norway is not even a member of the EU. We are an associated member, but we still will do what they tell us to do. We will go for close to zero energy buildings in seven years. And that's tomorrow. Are we ready for it? I don't know. Have we questioned the strategy? I don't think so. I will uh, split this part into four. Uh, first of all, uh, the discussion on area efficiency. Secondly, on uh, 
the overuse of insulation, will, which will be a challenge for you as well as for us up north. Um, third discussion, climate change. Uh, are we taking in the consequences of climate change? Uh, and thirdly, uh, the low-cost renewable energy, which is changing the game altogether. First of all, uh, area efficiency. We are building bigger and bigger palaces um, um, for the people that can afford it. We are using more and more area. I think strategy number one in any type of architecture should be area efficiency. Reduce on the volume, reduce on the area, because that's where it is costing, both to construct and to run. Now, look at this. Um, this is um, uh, Le Corbusier's Le Cabanon in south of France, where he and his wife uh, spent all of his summers and where he also died swimming. Um, uh, this is a beautiful little tight cottage. It's still there. You can visit it. You can't get in easily, but you can see it. Um, and they managed on eight square meters per person. But uh, I must add, this little door here is going into the next door building, which he also designed, which is a restaurant. So he had this private little restaurant next door, which means he saved on the kitchen. But still, eight square meter per person is very, very little. Um, the development in Norway in housing, and we see this in many parts of the world, is that it's gone from 29 square meter per person in 67 to 54 now. So it's almost double. And it's getting too much. Uh, it's getting so much that the consequence is that when uh, families um, 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 are uh, reduced because the children move out, then uh, the house uh, is getting too big for families remaining, the, how, the husband and wife, for example. So they sell. They have to sell the house before uh, they want to, really, because it's, it's just too spacious. This is the average. So you can imagine what the really big places are like. Um, and of course, we still have some places that are too small for people that don't have the economy. What we find in Norway is that there are two economies now developing. One is the oil economy. Everybody employed in the oil industry makes a heck of a lot of money, regardless of the level. Uh, everybody else is uh, quite poor. The Norwegian state is super rich. The people are split in two groups. It's those who get their wages from the oil industry, and then there are those that are in other industries or um, institutions like health institutions, nurses, teachers in lower schools, etc. They cannot afford these kind of uh, buildings anymore, so they are moving out of the city center. It gets too expensive for us. So while the picture you get of Norway as a state which is super rich because of all the oil and arms sales, we are as people not super rich. We're split into two groups. It creates a hell of a lot of um, conflict. And this is, in my view, one of the reasons why the Social Democratic Party lost power in Norway this summer after 40 years. The people are getting fed up with uh, the uh, difference in uh, level among the, the average people. And the parties now in are slightly to the right of the center. They are not right wing as some papers write. They are fairly moderate, slightly to the right of the center. And they are saying they're going to change this picture. Let's see. Anyway, discussion number two is the um, drive towards more and more insulation. And it's getting uh, too fast, the drive, I think. Uh, it's getting so fast that uh, when we are up to 50 centimeter thick walls, it's too much manpower needed, too much resources, too much materials. And as you see on this example, on a small site of 18 meter by 10 meters, if you're allowed to build 30% of this, you can build a house with a floor area in external uh, footprint of 60 square meters, roughly. If you build 60 square meter on this kind of site, 25% of your print on the site will be walls. So you lose one-fourth of your 
print to build four walls. So alternatively, there are insulation methods coming up which are more efficient, slimmer, uh, too expensive still, and we don't know the, the ecological uh, consequences of all of them, but they are uh, less area demanding and they only will need 5% uh, of your ground external area when you build. So um, I think it's gone too far. It's gone too far uh, also because when you look at this table of uh, the efficiency of insulation, uh, this is the um, uh, U value, the insulation value. This is the thickness of the wall. And if you increase the thickness of a wall insulation from 15 centimeter to 20, this is the increase in U value, 0.06. If you increase from 25 to 30, the efficiency is only half of that, 0.03. If you go even further where we are now, from 40 to 45, the curve is almost getting flat. It's, the efficiency will increase 0.015. So where we are now, this part of the scale, the efficiency of adding 5 centimeters of insulation has uh, an effect which is only one-fourth of the effect of here. So the really good effect of insulation is when you have a poorly insulated building and increase the insulation a little. When you have an excellent insulated building and increase it a little, it's a waste of money, it's a waste of work and time. So I repeat my argument that um, the materials become more and more um, important. I'm going to jump very quickly to uh, the question of um, another sector, the transportation sector. This is what I'm talking about this afternoon. Um, if you look at the new uh, super electric cars on the market, like the Tesla and like the Nissan Leaf, in Norway, the best-selling model of any cars, of any petrol car, electric car, in September was the Tesla. No other cars sold better. In October, it was the Nissan Leaf. So the drive now is towards electric vehicles. But if you look at this table, you'll find that in a Nordic power mix, it's all right because we have a lot of hydropower. If you go to the Central European power mix, and the worst is the Estonian, like East European. There is so much coal involved that you might as well, instead of buying an electric car, you might as well buy a petrol car, which is smaller and lighter. You don't pollute anything more. But I warn you, this picture will change when the renewable energy is introduced in a big way in, in Europe, which it will be in due time. So what we do find also is that because of the production of the electric vehicles being very energy demanding and also CO2 producing because of the footprint uh, from uh, batteries, etc. The, the um, um, electric vehicles are bringing with them uh, a handicap. When they come out from the factory, if you take all the energy needed to produce that car and turn it into CO2, it is 156 grams CO2 per kilometer of the car over its life. So the main pollution from the car is not that it's driving, but it's the production of the car. And it's exactly the same thing when you begin to look at uh, buildings. It's the materials that will matter. It's what you actually <laughs> produce with which match up. It's not the running cost of the car or the building. This is the big change in my view. Now discussion number three on climate change, um, and I think this is a very um, demanding and serious issue. Uh, we find, and you see this in a paper all the time, extremely cold with weather, a lot of people dying in Britain over this winter, uh, extremely hot weather, uh, a lot of people dying in the cities of uh, southern Europe, Paris, Italy, also um, when it gets overheated, mainly because the architecture is not naturally ventilated. 
um, there are very few um, uh, buildings that can adapt from uh, at a time when you have bigger apartments and then you split it into smaller apartments and suddenly you don't have natural ventilation, cross ventilation from one room to the other. You have one window on one side and you don't manage to cool down the building. It gets overheated. This is how 40 to 55,000 people died in France and Italy uh, during the heat wave a few years ago. Mainly sick or elderly people left there for the summer, uh, and nobody to attend, and they didn't drink enough water, so they dehydrated. It's a big drama and a big tragedy. The problem is that the uh, IPCC, the UN Climate Panel, are saying that it's going to get warmer and warmer. And we are losing the big target we are looking for, 2% degrees centigrade rise from prehistoric time by 2100. This target is lost. We're not going to make it because the CO2 emissions are just going up. And you probably saw the papers this morning on the CO2 emissions in, um, from coal. It's, it's a rocketing. It's going bananas. So... The question is, how warm is it going to be, and does it matter for our architecture in the north and south and east and west? It does. The trajectories, the um, projections of the um, uh, IPCC, by 2100, varies between plus one degree and six degrees. The IA says between three and six degrees. So what does this matter? What does this mean? Uh, three degrees, six degrees? I think the... Uh, IPCC are now saying that uh, 4.8 degrees average annual temperature rise globally is more realistic than 2 degrees. 2 degrees is lost. Is this a lot? Let's see. Europe is split into mainly three climate zones. And you can put more or less any city into this. Is the cold climate, is the Stockholm, Oslo, Bergen, where I come from, Average temperature annually 6.7. Then it's the temperate climate, which is Zurich 9.1, warm Milan 11.7. The difference between them is two, two and a half degree roughly. From the cold climate to the warm climate is five. If the worst, cost, worst case scenarios are right, uh, then I am going to, in Norway, design buildings soon, soon which are not. Uh, this temperature, but they are Milan temperature. I have to relate to a climate, which means I, in my mind, I have to jump to climate zones. Because, okay, 2100 is not here yet, but it will be a, um, a smooth increase in temperature over time, like a straight line. This is what the IPCC thinks. So we have to prepare, and so have you, uh, for designing buildings that can take hotter and hotter climate. And mind you, this is average temperatures. When we, to this add the fact of the big um, typhoons we've seen lately, this one from the Philippines, uh, we don't know, of course, whether this is uh, climate change related or not. Uh, but what we do know is that with climate, ca with climate change comes more and more uh, rain, more and more wind, rougher weather, uh, higher temperatures, more extreme temperatures also, more cold and more warm. This is pictures recently from the Philippines typhoon, and what you see is that everything was just gone. Uh, everything that's left is some concrete structures. So I would argue that... Um, we should look at a different strategy, perhaps, where we, instead of insulating our buildings and making them into fortresses altogether, you know, by protecting ourselves uh, through the whole envelope, we should perhaps not go completely bananas in terms of insulation and construction. We should make buildings that are lighter, that can be naturally ventilated, they can be naturally cool because not only are 
your climate's going to be warmer, so is mine. And we're all going to have to deal with extreme temperatures, extreme weather, and higher temperatures. So this means we should not insulate too much, we should be moderate, but inside every building, this is a kindergarten, uh, we should look for a room that is a, I call it a crisis room, it's a terrible word, but it's a room that can withstand anything. A room you can go into, and not like a shelter, it will have to be a nice room, but it will be a room that is structurally sound, made out of materials that can take some hammering, and it should be, have its own water supply, and it should have its own energy supply, heating, cooling. Uh, for the extreme case. This is what the IPCC is telling us what is coming. But we're not responding to it. We're not responding to the dramatically uh, changed weather coming on. We are instead responding as if everything will be like it is and we just make better and better buildings, more and more insulation, more and more technology. The technology will just be wiped out we need to think alternative strategies where we uh, question what we are doing and try to come up with innovative solutions. My last discussion is discussion number four, low cost renewable energy and this changes the game altogether in my view, mainly because uh, there are new energy sources coming into the market uh, like solar electricity, um, which is falling so dramatically in price. I don't know if you can see this, but um, this is what a, a disruptive technology looks like. The price of solar energy has fallen from 1977, 1977, 70 US dollars per watt peak to 0.7 US dollars per watt peak. A factor of 100 factor of 100 in 25 years. So it keeps on falling. That means solar PV is going to be so cheap that it's going to knock out anything you know. It's going to knock out all the known renewable, sorry, it's going to knock out all the known traditional energy sources in Europe within five years. It's going to knock out coal, oil, natural gas, and uh, nuclear. It's going to do this in the UK, in Germany, in France, in Italy, in Spain. This is the way it's going. This means here you will probably have uh, an energy source which can, if it's grid connected, doesn't need any storage because the grid is the storage. It can provide you, it's a building element, it's a facade or it's something in the landscape and it can provide you energy at a much lower price than anything else. So the oil age will not last until there is no more oil, just like the stone age did not last until there were no more stones. The typing machine is gone because we found other more adequate methods of writing. The uh, coal-powered trains didn't go because uh, there was no more coal. They went because there were more efficient ways of transporting people. This is the same thing that's going to happen to the fossil fuel motor industry. The electric cars would just knock the old technology overboard. So technologies change not because the resources that we base them on are uh, uh, gone, they are changing because more adequate technology comes in. Think of the mobile phone, the PC, it's uh, a revolution happening. Now, let's look at the big guys, what they are saying. The BP said in uh, 2001 that uh, in its uh, energy paths to 2050, that this is going to what's going to happen to the traditional energy sources. It's going to fall dramatically in importance. Uh, the renewable energy sources is going to rise dramatically. What are 
the um, US expecting? They are expecting that the energy is going to come mainly from renewable energy sources. Here you, you see ground heat, solar, wind, um, and it's going to be a steep growth of these energy sources. What we see now with the US going into shale oil, that kind of thing, is probably just a temporary thing. It's a way of getting out of the trap they're in where they are importing a lot of foreign oil from unstable regimes like the Middle East and Norway. Um, they, are, they are getting rid of this uh, terrible import uh, uh, problem and they are looking for their own energy resources. And this is a heck of a drive and it's going fast. Shell is saying in its uh, new scenario, land scenario in last year, that by 2100, same year as the IPCC are talking about the temperature rises, by 38% of the energy is going to come from solar PV, solar electricity. So if this is happening, we need to look at solar as something you don't only put on your wall or your roof. We have to look at it as something you uh, put in the landscape near to the building, uh, in the surroundings uh, and at a distance so that the new sculptures talk to the listed buildings that are already built that we are not allowed to touch, but you talk to a solar heating system at a distance and it transfers heat into the building. If it's heat or if it's electricity, it goes via the grid. You do new kind of parking lots, you do new kind of parks, and in a very, very hot climate, like this building I'm doing in Cyprus, 80% uh, of the energy need is for cooling. Uh, it's a university building, and of course, we use natural ventilation for the cooling, but we use natural ventilation that has gone through huge earth ducts underground, mass, cooling the air down from 35 centigrades to 24 into the building, and if we need to lower the temperatures even more, we have the solar PV. So the combination of earth ducts, natural ventilation, solar PV, all of these walls are solar PV, mainly because we find that solar PV is um, what we want to use, but it's also the uh, facade material that the client found cheapest compared to the other facade materials he wanted. So there is a game change. Everything is changing, and <clears throat> we need to adapt to that, and this is really my measure. I wrote a book in, uh, I think you mentioned it, in 92, uh, which called The Sunshine Revolution. I'm going to give you a copy for the library. Um, uh, the Sunshine Revolution I was forecasting here has happened. It's not about to happen. It has happened, and it went slightly faster than I predicted, which is good, but which surprised me. I think you should all go back uh, tonight when you go home and read a little note for yourself, a few lines on what you think the world is going to be like in 20 years. When you pick that note up in 20 years, you'll be surprised how, how much faster the world has developed in all ways, in positive ways, in negative ways, but technologically, I think there is a lot of interesting things happening. So I will finally uh, say that um, we should go back to Frank Lloyd Wright's first building in uh, Falling Water and do the opposite of what he did. We should learn from how nature is put together, how termites organized and naturally ventilated um, systems, communities, and we should uh, use more daylight, we should use more of the natural resources, we should get close, closer to nature, and then, of course, add on our modern technologies. And above all, with the IPCC, the temperature changes and everything, when facts change, I think we should change our minds. We should not stick to the old school and just do what we always have done. Thank you.
to the Dr. Rodrigue. Next question, please. Everybody agrees. Or everybody disagrees. That would be a nice discussion. Well, since no one is asking, I, I do have a, a question. So in, in no way, so can you hear me? So basically, you were saying that um, uh, we've been building a super insulated buildings uh, <coughs> lately, and, and that you think that even in Norway, in colder uh, Europe, um, we should start thinking on passive ways of, of uh, cooling the building since the temperatures are increasing and so on. Um, who is the, so, so which is the actor that uh, comes with the highest opposition to your ideas of adding passive ways of ventilation, uh, since I guess it's not a, a common uh, problem in Norway. I, I would say that plenty of customers are used to, you know, super insulated houses, and this is what they think about when they when they think about uh, energy efficiency. Um, who is the so? How do you convince them, and who is the toughest to convince? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, let me just uh, clarify a little because um, um, in. In my climate, uh, like in your climate, there are extreme parts of the year. Uh, you, you have a terribly hot summer in Barcelona, sometimes too hot, <clears throat> but most of the year is fine. Same in Norway. We have two, three months when it's slightly cold. You know, We have no months on the west coast where the temperature drops below zero on average. It might drop below zero for a few days, but never on average in a month centigrade. This means we are not designing buildings for nine months of the year. We are designing our buildings for the demands two, three months a year when it's chilly. Uh, this is what I think is wrong. I think we should design the buildings for the majority of the year and then have parts of the building that uh, responds to the short period of the year. The problem is that the building regulations, all the traditional, um, you, know, you know, you have to go to this motion and make building regulations, they are designed for one specific use for a year. And they're designed for the coldest part. They're going to stand up and withstand the good indoor climate in the colder part. So this is the problem. There is no, there is no difference between uh, summer and winter in the way we design buildings, and the regulations don't respond to that either. So uh, who is the opposition? Um, I think the opposition is ourselves as uh, architectural and engineering community, because how are regulations made? They are made by um, uh, governments, uh, by uh, departments, um, uh, responding to uh, the industry's uh, wishes and also the industry's uh, uh, proposals. Uh, some want to sell more insulation, some want to sell heat pumps, some want to sell, you know, they're very active, just like the oil lobby is very active. But where are we as architects? Because when these regulations are made, uh, they are sent out on a hearing, everybody can respond and you know, say that I disagree with this, I have an alternative strategy. But this doesn't happen. As a community, we are totally obedient and we are not responding, we are not, uh, we are not uh, even replying to their request. So when they look at the documents finally, uh, I know this because in Norway I've been on some boards where this happened, and you're surprised at seeing how few comments come in from the community. Although we know architects and engineers are thinking uh, for themselves, and they are disagreeing with a lot of um, trends happening in these uh, regulations. But when the um, day is over, there is hardly any comments from the architectural community, uh, so it just carries on. This is how laws are made, and as they say, you know, you don't want to know how a law is made or how a sausage is made. It's kind of uh, 
it's kind of a, a tough business, I think. Okay, we were, for all this morning, we were talking about that, okay, the, the, the weather is changed and we need to like focus on one thing, but I think so that sometimes the problem is that you don't realize that you have, okay, all is changed, but you are in one country and you need to decide what is going to, to happen in this country. Because I think so that now sometimes you try to take like a, I received like for one things to do, okay, to try to do, uh, to or oh, try to design one things to all the countries, and I think so that 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 is the problem that you don't realize that you have like a different reality mm. in different countries. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's an important uh, comment. I think. I think the way regulations are made, for example, when the IPB comes from the EU. Each country has a possibility to uh, adapt this uh, directive to their own uh, weather conditions. Uh, we do this in Norway, so the Norwegian conditions will be slightly tougher than the uh, Spanish ones. Um, but I think we could go even further. Uh, and I think, um, I think we as a community should, uh, should be more active in, in uh, arguing the way you now argue. Um, but since we are the experts in a way and we don't argue against it, uh, this is how the regulations are made. Um, each country is different, but I think um, from what I can see, uh, if I am going to believe in the IPCC, uh, which I do because I am not an expert, I can argue against them, I'm not a meteorologist, I assume they know what they're doing, uh, the result of this is that your climate is going to be more like the kind of climate I'm going to design in, in the future because our temperatures up north is going to be the same as yours. So in a way it's becoming more and more like one Europe <laughs> but it's unfortunately getting warmer and warmer and uh, I, think, I think it is happening now from the data I see. Uh, I, I didn't touch upon the melting of the icebergs and this kind of thing, but of course there are things happening. On the other hand, as an um, overall uh, attitude, uh, my, my, I, I've been working on this uh, kind of problems or challenges, I call them, because I, you know, I think we can overcome them um, for many decades, and I I'm, I'm more optimistic than ever. Because I, in the early days, I always felt uh, nobody's listening. Now uh, the world is becoming aware that there is a problem and uh, the media is there and they communicate the problem uh, and because of this um, there will be changes. Um, uh, it has to be bad enough before there is a change and I think it's gone bad enough and that's when the change happened. So I'm, I'm very optimistic in many ways. I also think when you look at the global population explosion, we thought we were going to end up with 17 billion people. We are going to stabilize around 9 billion. That's a heck of a difference if you look at the global picture and the developing countries and the poverty, etc. So there are a lot of parameters um, uh, which are going in a positive direction. So I, I don't want to... I don't want to push this image of um, climate change and everything as something only negative. Uh, there's, there are some positive sides of it and just like the situation in Spain now in the labor market is completely different from Norway, um, uh, I, th I think uh, I wouldn't worry too much about that either because things go like this. And when you're on a valley on the downside, you learn a lot and you become a much stronger person and I think uh, that's also necessary. When I graduated from England decades ago, there was only five people from my year who got a job in England. Everybody else uh, exported themselves to the rest of the world. 
Um, that was terrible at the time, but uh, we were five people that stayed in London working. Uh, the rest, you know, ended up on all continents you can think of. The great thing about it is that this was a blessing for most of us because um, even today, every five years, we meet somewhere in the world and every time half of us turn up and uh, we have established a fantastic network of people all over the world uh, that we are still in contact with. So um, sometimes life can also get too easy. Um, uh, I think some resistance sometimes builds us also in a positive way. So. Well, thank you very much for your presentation. I was, uh, I think, the example of Frank Lloyd Wright was very uh, illustrative because, in a way, it reminds that um, in a time where uh, architecture was uh, mainly vernacular architecture, these problems of adapting to a particular environment did not exist. I mean, we knew how to build uh, sustainable communities, um, appropriate houses with cross ventilation. We still have examples of that uh, we can know. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, uh, I was thinking about your presentation that actually what the problem we have now is that we are, our place is, is no longer the place that we built in the past, but actually the place where we build today is the global, the global community, the global economy, the global climate, and therefore that changed completely the parameters where, and the, the way of thinking, the way of building. Mm -hmm. This is one reflection. The other one is that maybe related to that, is that um, we, were, we have seen um, many examples of, of isolated buildings, but um, what about the how we can manage at the urban scale. I mean, yeah. can we have any chance as urban planners to really make more sustainable communities mm. when cities all over the world are growing according to the laws of economy? Yeah. And we don't have as planners many times options to move people from uh, or to model the way they, they work or to minimize transportation between job place and, and, yeah. and living. So do you think we have as urban planners still any chance to make a positive impact? Mm. Yeah. I, th I think uh, uh, th those are also great questions. I think um, I'm, I'm optimistic on that note because I think w w you're, and you're, you're 100% right. And in the book somewhere there is a picture showing how we used to do our vernacular architecture. Different climates in different parts of the world and the response architecturally is uh, as follows. You know, dry climate, thick walls wet climate, uh, light materials, um, natural ventilation, cold climate, insulation, etc. Uh, then we started building the same thing all over the place. Uh, glass boxes wherever you are in the world, more or less. So, uh, of course, the vernacular architecture is the source that we should go back to, and nature is the thing which um, could inspire us to remember why vernacular architecture developed. Um, I think we're on the way of going back to that. Uh, I think uh, just the world, the word natural ventilation uh, means some understanding in this, uh, in this, um, the, the, uh, not the overuse of glass, but the moderate use of glass, window sizes, etc. cetera. Um, I, I, I think that's a big, big learning source. In terms of cities, in many ways, to me, it's the, it's the same uh, kind of challenge. We need, to, we need to look at how the really big communities that attract people are, how, how really the attractive communities are. Why are they attractive? Why do people want to be there? And it's possible to define some qualities. Uh, qualities, of course, are distance, is pollution, is greenery, is work and uh, living close by. Uh, more and more, though, I think, when you see how some cities developed and some of the mega cities of the world, it's very depressing to visit some of the mega cities of the world, I think, especially the suburbs. Uh, but when you, on the other hand, jump to the good cities of the world, you see that they are, um, the way I experienced them, um, split up into villages. I mean, London is a, is a range of villages. Uh, and a lot of people are beginning to reduce their transportation mainly because they work and live in the same kind of village. Uh, I don't mean outside London, I mean London as a central core is split into different parts. So some people live in this central little village in London and they don't move to the other side of London <coughs> for uh, shopping or anything. 
So um, how can we make our communities better so that we stay in our little villages in the big city? I think that's one of the goals, in, instead of just expanding and expanding. and um, How can we um, densify the cities and also at the same time uh, make them more livable? Um, it's going to take time, I think. You want to follow up on that? Or? Well, I think uh, uh, the idea that uh, big cities like London with 8 million people now, I think they are developing a kind of network of communities, I think it makes sense. I think it reflects some of what's going on right now mm -hmm. in many other places. Perhaps at this scale we can do something um, to minimize transportation or to optimize uh, energy consumption. Uh, I remember a, a place I had uh, the opportunity to visit at the end of the 80s. I think it was in Davis, California. There was at the end of the 80s, there was a community which were already uh, implementing uh, at the community level solar panels, uh, energy mm -hmm. consumption devices, yeah. uh, saving devices. And that work at the level of a little community. And I think this strategy yeah. of um, putting together uh, people at the small scale where you can um, have an impact not only on the building design but also in the way they live, yeah. uh, social sustainability, not only energy uh, consumption. Yeah. I, I think that makes sense. Uh, on mm -hmm. the other hand, we have to um, complement that with the fact that cities are developing at the scale yeah. that is driven by the economy mainly and not by sustainability reasons, I think. Yeah. There, uh, there, are, um, there are a great number, I think, of uh, examples of places like Davis. There's another one in America in outside Phoenix um, done by uh, Paolo Soleri, the Italian architect that just died, um, Arco Santi, which was a, a, a big uh, attempt at building a completely new uh, city in a desert where all of these, uh, I think, wise um, measures were taken with the distance from work to labor, etc. Of course, he didn't have any money. He was stubborn. He, want, he didn't want any sponsors, so he wanted to work on donations. So it's going to take hundreds of years to build it. But uh, there are many hubs in the world where this new thinking is going on and where, where, um, where, where people are thinking thoughts that can be replicable other places. Um, I met Paulo Soleri many times in Arizona in, in his... Uh, is uh, Arco Santi, and I think that's also a model to look at um, if you're doing something on a fresh land without going into an existing city. Arco Santi, the uh, combination of arcology and architecture, Arco Santi. <laughs>